Hey there, YouTube. Back from a trip. Thought I'd take a few uh, kind of random questions and comments on the channel. I'll drop uh, videos in the next couple days. Then I'm going for a month, so I don't know how many videos there's going to be. Maybe a few, but not a ton. Not a ton. Hey, Ben, I understand this is a shooting channel, but didn't you do a video on the Mach 1 sometime back? If so, will we see more ripping in the Miata? Uh, I put up a video maybe a couple years ago uh, where I did a like a like a racing school that was in in Mach ones, um, just to relate it to shooting training because I thought that was kind of interesting. Maybe I'd post something like that in the future. Maybe I don't know. We'll see if there's interest. That and I need time to go to a track, which is I don't have a lot of time these days. Next comment, when working doubles with a Glock no less, my second shots go low when I feel like I'm controlling mu muzzle rise. Once I'm perceiving more muzzle rise and just ride the recoil like a wave, that's when accuracy goes up and split times go down. When I got into shooting, everyone I followed was all about death gripping the gun and recoil mitigation. Ben's the first instructor I followed whose concepts have undoubtedly made me a better shooter. It got me over the plateaus. I just have to train like crazy to overwrite the bad habits I learned elsewhere. Yeah, I think it is... I think it's just a better way to to, percept, to conceptualize what it is you're trying to do. Is like we're not trying to make there not be recoil or stop the gun from rising up. If you're consistent with what you're doing, that's what's going to matter. I mean, if the gun will come back the same way, then you can just shoot really quickly once everything is predictable. All right. My takeaway is the nominal performance gain for most people isn't going to be worth the exorbitant extra cost. I'd never spend the money on a staccato when I can get very suitable combat handgun for four times less. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, that's a very reasonable take. Like, the more expensive guns, and not like just staccatos, but anything that is like, if it's more than just, um, I don't know, a striker-fired pistol for a few hundred dollars, maybe an optic or a lighter, like whatever accessories you feel you need. If you're buying, if you're spending more than that, I think, just admit to yourself you're doing it because you want to or you think it's cool or you think it's interesting or whatever. Like nobody really needs uh, that that shit, like the more expensive guns. You don't need a staccato. Like if you want one, like, okay, whatever. I don't think, I think it'd be kind of crazy to feel like you need that. And it'd also be like kind of weird. Like if you don't have that, you feel like, oh, I'm, I, you know, I don't have enough gun or something like that. That's just... That's just not the way I see it. I mean, there's not, it's not that dramatic of a difference that you need that. I mean, but again, if you want that, if you want to spend your money that way and you think it's fun, you think it's cool, I've got no problem with that. I think that's fine. All right. Hey, Ben, I know this is off topic, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on three foreigners sweeping the CO Nats podium. Lots of talk about IPSC. Versus USPSA, different training styles, more professionalism over there, etc. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting topic. So if you're probably not aware, but uh, USPSA, Carry Optics Nationals, that's the biggest division now, by the way. It just went on. Uh, the top three guys in the match were not from this country. It was the, the CZ team, uh, Grafell, Martin Kaminicek, Edsel uh, as well. I, I mean, like, I'll just tell you this. That doesn't surprise me to see that result. Like, I wasn't surprised. I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, like, I I know, well, I know two-thirds of those guys pretty well. Griffel recruited me for the Tanfolio team back in the day. At, at, a, at a match in the U.S., he's like, oh, the Americans hate you. I was like, they hate me too. Like, <laughs> you should come be on the team. I worked with Martin as well. We worked together in Russia for a few years Um uh, shooting and training, stuff like that. Like, I, I know these guys and how they train and all of that. And like I said, I'm not surprised by this result. Uh, I would say the shooting in uh, in Europe is generally a lot more challenging and a lot more technical. And then the training among those guys, like the mentality that drives that group is is way different. In terms of professionalism, how, how demanding the training is going to be, what the lifestyle is going to be like, um, they just have a different concept of what's going to happen and how it's going to go. Like when I was just focused on competitive shooting, I was training a lot like these guys train. And it I mean, you're shooting every day, 500,000 rounds, like five days a week, um, all the time, making it as challenging as you can. Like it's, it's, it's good. Like it's a, it's a fun life, but, uh, 
the American guys typically don't train that hard. Like the guy national champion now uh, in the U.S., uh, Jacob Hetherington, he he does. I mean, he's on the AMU and he shoots like crazy and it makes it very hard for himself. Like he really challenges himself. He's great. Um, but even that, it's like not as demanding as what the guys in Europe are doing, especially when it comes to the moving targets, uh, the consistency, the professionalism. It's a completely different approach. Not, I wouldn't say like all of Europe, but just like those guys specifically, the way that crew runs it, it's um, it's not something that most people would, it's, it's not realistic for anybody to do it really. Like very, very few people can shoot that much where they're gonna shoot 100 or 150,000 rounds a year. Very technical and demanding uh, type of uh, training. Like it's just, people don't do that here. They just don't, I, shit, they don't do it there either. Again, it's just, it's not even, it's, I don't think it's as much driven by regional differences as just like those are just the best guys over there and they train they they do it different than the than the guys here i mean like christian seiler for example other guys like it's not their full-time job to shoot it's not a full-time thing for most people in the u.s even like we have people here that maybe like i think shane's on glock's team for example i think he goes to i don't know for sure but i think he goes to an office most of the time and does like marketing stuff and then even the the pro shooting is like a part time thing. That's a part of that gig. It's just different. It's a different life. It's a different lifestyle. All right? Can you talk about flashlights on competition pistols? Not in reference to home defense or anything like that. A friend of mine and myself are having a discussion and notice that you'll never see competition shooters with flashlights on pistols. I think you will see competition shooters with flashlights on pistols. I think you will. Maybe not as much as before. Um, to speak to that a little bit, you want to consider a couple things, weight and balance. So this shadow, for example, most people, myself included, I mean, the weight of it is good for competitive shooting. So, I mean, it's heavier than most 9mm pistols for sure than what most people would carry. Soaks up the recoil pretty good. Um, but in terms of balance, it's a little bit front heavy, which genuinely I don't like. So you're going to pay for that, making the, the guns less precise to swing around, but it softens it up in recoil some. Um, most people would not add a flashlight to this gun, you know, but that front heavy feel does, it does change the recoil impulse. And when you're just shooting a single target, a lot of people like it. The Glock, like if you take just a, well, most polymer pistols are going to be balanced pretty similar to this. Uh, taking this, like this is not really front heavy, you know? Especially if you get a brass plug in it, like it's not front heavy at all. I mean, it'd be probably rear heavy in that case. I think this one has a plastic plug. This one feels pretty well balanced. But let's say I put a brass plug in here and a flashlight on the front. Now I've increased the weight of the pistol considerably, I would say. And it's going to change the way it feels and it's still pretty balanced. So in that situation, probably more people would be interested in a flashlight. In the end, this type of stuff like the, the composition of the guide rod, whether or not you have a flashlight, you could take the, uh, the light mechanism out of the light and like put in lead weights you know, to add more weight in a flat if you wanted. You could have a brass plug back here. You can, if it's a gun with grip panels, like we can make these out of G10, we can make them out of brass. Uh, and all of these things, I would say they work together to get you to have the weight and balance uh, that you like on your pistol. Um, I wouldn't just consider the flashlight the flashlight in isolation. Again, it's going to be part of this whole this whole package, and you want to get it set up so that you're you mean you like the way that it it's you know handles swinging it around between targets, and it you like the way that it shoots you know on on target. Eventually, guys just nerd out and start splitting hairs here where it doesn't really matter that much, which you know. That's what they do with everything. But generally, get the gun for a competitive setting. Get the gun the weight and balance that you feel like you like. Train with that. Um, preferences might change over time, but, you know, there it is. Anyway, that's it for today, guys. Questions, comments, put them below.